Hello, everyone. I hope it has been an interesting day for you all. Uh, some meet, meeting new folks or you know, old folks which you have met before, and I'm learning some uh, more around security. So I'm very excited to be here to, with you all today discussing on data privacy and security, uh, implementing uh, responsible practices on at AWS uh, in regards to engine AI. I'm AJ Govindaram. I'm a senior solution actor at AWS. Uh, uh, I've been with AWS two years now, uh, but before that as well, I've been in this domain developing AIML solutions and also data solutions around more than one and a half decade now. I can say that, close to two decades. So uh, very happy to be here now. So just to, just to set stage right, uh, let me, allow me to brief about generative AI or Gen AI. You know, it's a feel, or I can say that it's a class of artificial intelligence to generate new content. Uh, it could be like images, text, or it could be any other multimedia, all right? And uh, so it, it has a, it's a generative by itself is a system which could understand and learn to uh, a massive amounts of data and then generate new original content. So if you look back, right, the origin of Gen AI can be traced all the way uh, the advancements or the achievements in the area of deep learning models and also natural language processing. And one key area, uh, which is the advent of the 2017 paper, which is Transformers, right? You know, that has been given a big boost to work towards this one. Uh, because of the sequence-to-sequence the -sequence tasks, such as the language transition or the language uh, text generation or the transition again, right? So transformers have proven to be highly effective in capturing long-range uh, dependency data, making them well-suited for Gen AI applications. So, and as we look at the current industry, you know, they have disrupted all the way from the software development all the way to the creative uh, industries, you know, content creation or any other creative industry. And however, with this transformers, transformative technology, you know, it, there's also need for robust security it has to be in place, security measures or the data pri privacy practices to be taken care. And at AWS, we understand that. You know, we every day live with that. It's our top priority. And we have implemented a rigorous measures to uh, protect our customers' data and ensure the responsible deployment of Gen AI applications. You know? And one notable development, I would say, is, is the, in, within the AI industry, is the emergence of companies like Anthropic, who has dedicated in developing with what they call is constitutional AI. Uh, this approach imbue AI systems with the strong ethical framework and the principles that uh, guide, guide the decision process, ensuring they operate and align with the uh, societal norms and also ethical practices. And as we de uh, dive deep into the Gen AI, you know, we must uh, understand the broader implications of, uh, of responsible AI practices. And uh, it's just not the technology advancements, but also the uh, practices which by uh, societal norms, ethical practices, and also the regulations what we uh, come into picture. And as we go forward as well, we'll talk about, we'll highlight a few of the AWS services as well, like AWS Bedrock as well. So with that, I would like to, uh, like Isha and Parth introduce themselves, Isha about uh, you? Please. Yeah. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for staying Friday evening. I know everybody wants to go home, so thank you so much for taking the time to attend the session. Um, I'm Isha Dua, Ishni Dua. I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. I've been at AWS about four and a half years at this point. I work out of the Bay Area. Um, I currently support, uh, you know, generative AI foundational model provider customers, and I help them be successful on the cloud, make sure that they're well architect, they're deploying and architecting their workloads and following security best practices, as well as other uh, pillars of well architected uh, framework that we have. Um, Within AWS, we have something called technical field communities, and uh, I'm a member of the uh, AIML field community as well as the environmental sustainability community. Um, and I'm here to talk from a responsible AI perspective. Um, I know, so security, I, in my opinion, at least for generative AI, 
expands beyond you know, the, uh, the encryptions and the uh, isolations that we talk about. It also talks about the ethics piece of AI as well. So I'll talk about that today. Um, looking forward to our talk and would love to chat with any of you if you want to stay later and chat. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks, Isha. Parth? Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for sticking around for the session. Uh, I am Parth Patel. I am a sol senior solution architect over here at AWS. Um, been here with AWS for three and a half years now, and um, I have a long uh, lasting uh, consulting experience. And I like to work with customer, understand their need, and uh, peel the onion and, and show them how it works under the hood in terms of any security services or any machine learning services. Uh, so today, uh, very excited to be here and talk about how we can um, uh, implement security and how we can think about implementing security and responsible AI uh, in this generative uh, AI era. So looking forward to uh, talk to you, everyone. Thanks, Bart. We would hear different vantage points here, you know, from Isha perspective and also from Parth today. And uh, coming back to my first question, right? Uh, I've been talking to a lot of C-suites, CISOs today, and I hear different set of challenges. You know, it could be before Gen AI and also after Gen AI that has exploded in a big way. Uh, with your experience, Isha uh, and Parth, what are the few challenges uh, which CISOs are expressing today in adopting Gen AI applications? Let's start with you, Parth. Sure. So uh, the most of the CISO or C-suite that we talked about, more than 50% 50, 50 of the questions is regarding uh, data privacy and security risks. Um, data is a mode for all the organization. It, it's their, it's their uh, you know, recipe for their success. Today, generative AI is uh, so sophisticated that it is producing very high quality uh, text, image, audio, and now videos as well. And uh, a lot of time, generative AI models generate the output which is based on a training data. Uh, the CISOs are concerned about uh, how, uh, what happened if their proprietary information like PI information of their organization or intellectual property or any other, uh, uh, any other information is being um, used for training to this model. So that's a primary concern for all the C-suite. Um, what, and, and, and right now, a lot of, uh, you, you, you guys might know, a lot of articles and, and media surfacing around data leaks of, uh, from their model. So, so that is a number one priority for all the CISOs. On top of it, uh, what uh, concern that they have is uh, regarding transparency and explainability. Um, they are, this, this particular model is an opaque black box for them, right? Uh, there is no traceability or, or explainability how model arrive to certain decision. Uh, this is a big problem uh, in specifically in a highly regulated industries where uh, you need to provide audit rail and you need to explain that high stake decision is based on certain model and how it has been arrived. So that is also one of the big concern that uh, I see when I, whenever I talk to the you know, C-suite. Um, and the last one is um, uh, the way I, I, I realize is because of this data risks, all the C-suite wants to adopt this new technology but uh, they want to be risk averse. So what they're trying to do is they want to first implement this Gen AI into their internal applications or internal stakeholders like uh, uh, you know, different departments and um, uh, trying to understand how this technology work, define the security posture and metrics, metrics before they actually go out and utilize for customers. And the challenge is because it's an internal application, um, Deploying this large language model is an immensely technically challenging task. And um, they don't able to justify the ROI in terms of a uh, lot of resources, development, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, de uh, development uh, effort uh, that they need to put for this internal application. So it's a little dilemma for the C-suite uh, that I see, but alongside with security risk, this is the top of mind for most of the uh, executives that we talked about. So it's an interesting point there, Maparth. Of course, explainability has been a big question from way back, you know, from the advent of uh, AIML. Okay. Isha, what have you been hearing? 
Um, so I think with any technology, like I think in every technology when it comes up, it brings its promises and it brings its challenges. So even for generative AI, I think we need to remember that at, at its core, it's a data-driven, high-performance computing workload. So you already have a bunch of those kind of workloads in your organizations, and there are already some security mandates and postures that have been established for those workloads. So for a generative AI workload as well, you will most likely start with the inheritance of those security postures. For, for whatever you're building. But uh, when I speak to security personnel at my customers, for my customers, some of the common threat, like some of the common questions that do come up are somewhat Parth mentioned, like, you know, how do I make sure that I'm uh, uh, dealing with the fairness and bias in model outputs? How do I make sure that the technology I'm using or the technology I'm building, it's, uh, it's not causing any harm to somebody or it's not being used to spread misinformation? Um, how do I make sure that proprietary data is not leaked? Um, you know, uh, one interesting anecdote I'd like to share about one of my customers. So we work with a lot of customers and imagine a customer that is a giant studio, like a studio that works with artists. It works with songwriters or script writers or, you know, some kind of a creative personnel. Um, they have to be very, they have to be very um, cautious when they use uh, large language models or these technologies because, for example, if I ask the large language model, you know, write me a love song and it writes me a song and it has lyrics very similar to a John Legend or a Taylor Swift, that could possibly open up my customers to legal ramifications because it could be considered copywriting data. You know, it could open you up to like legal indemnification issues. So these are also some of the questions around around security that I've heard customers bring up. And for them, uh, using a model that's free from copyright data is more important because they would rather not lose uh, all of that revenue that the artist generates for them. So even the legal pieces are very critical in this sector, at least. Thank you for that. We heard about the scaling complexities. We heard about the ethical risk, technical explainability, and also the legal liabilities. You know? That's an interesting one. So the nationalist question comes to me is, okay, how do we move forward uh, you know, as, a, as a practitioner, security practitioner, or the CISO? Uh, what should I look for that? And next step, Parth, you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, let's say CISO uh, and, and organization decided how they can move forward. Uh, so first thing I would like to uh, explain is organizations should have some security discipline, security posture uh, that has been defined. Um, what AWS does is uh, they have enhanced or, or they have come up with a generative AI security uh, scope, security scope metrics. What it does is it helps uh, organization to divide what kind of application that they are using. Uh, so there are five scopes uh, and two categories. Uh, this uh, first one category is uh, buying generative AI workload, but, and the second one is uh, building generative AI workload. Uh, the first two scopes, scope one and two, uh, belongs to the uh, buying generative AI workload. Uh, in this uh, scope, um, uh, first one is a consumer app. So this is an app where you utilize generative AI for performing certain tasks. For an example, chat GPT, it's a consumer app. You utilize it for uh, perform certain tasks and done with it. Uh, there are a lot of organization that provides uh, you know, SaaS-based services to perform certain tasks. So that's category one. The category two is enterprise apps. So you, you uh, as an organization, you might be using so many of the SaaS applications. For an example, ServiceNow or Salesforce or Jira or, or uh, GitLab as, as a source control. Uh, so all those SaaS provider is also coming up with a generative AI workload. So you should already have a security place for them, but how to utilize generative AI feature uh, and um, uh, uh, into that particular SaaS uh, product. So those are the two scope related to the uh, buying generative AI. Uh, the, third, uh, the third scope is related to the building generative AI uh, uh, category. Most of the customer fall into the scope number three, which is pre-trained models. Um, Think about it that you already have a custom application and you want to uh, leverage generative AI pre-trained model, uh, which is available from all different cloud providers. AWS has uh, Amazon Bedrock uh, services, which provides third-party models. And you want to utilize those models in your application and extend the functionality. 
So that particular one where we are expecting that most of the organization will have at least one uh, scope three uh, category application. Uh, and um, scope four is a, pre uh, uh, is a fine tune model. So some organization wants to fine tune based on their certain data to generate uh, marketing content or specific content for their organization. Um, and the last one is a self-tune uh, model. So this one is, um, as uh, uh, Isha mentioned, uh, if there are certain training data set that needs to be utilized for a particular uh, model, then organization might go to the route of self-tuning uh, a certain model. So AWS defined those five scope, and each scope has uh, five categories. Uh, governance and compliance, uh, privacy and uh, uh, governance, compliance, privacy, um, risk, resiliency, and access control. All those uh, five categories applies to all the scopes. So it will help any of you uh, as an organization to change your security discipline to adopt this generative AI workload. Um, all this uh, uh, scope also inherit uh, the AWS uh, standard uh, well-architected framework uh, uh, as well as it is also derived from uh, OWASP uh, security standard, NIST, or even ATLAS, which is uh, advanced threat detection landscape for uh, you know, AI systems. Um, and all of this standard also come up with how security can be enhanced for LLM or generative AI workload. So this particular scoping model will help organization to start with understanding how they can start adopting this uh, new security scope matrix for uh, your new workload on Generative AI. Thanks, for The scoping matrix definitely is a helpful tool, I think, to use as a reference as a starting point, at least. You also mentioned, interestingly, organization doesn't have to just go building them themselves. They can always start at certain AI stage. You know, they can start with adopting, which is already there in the market, then uh, drive towards they can building their own, or they can stick with that. Okay, that's a very interesting one. Okay, uh, and um, as they assess options, okay, uh, a practitioner, the CISOs, right? A key question comes to what security assessments or disciplines come into play? Isha, you wanna add to that? Yeah, um, I think I would go back to the basics. Uh, so I think part touched upon the right security uh, disciplines that would apply to all the different scopes, whether it's a, whether you're buying your generative AI technology or building your own. Um, like the first thing I would do is like any other use case you want to identify what your what is the business requirement, what is the use case you're solving for. Are there any SLAs that you need to adhere to? Whether are there any performance requirements? Are there any latency requirements? Are there any other kinds of business SLAs that you want to meet? So you first want to make sure that you have some sort of an architecture in place. So how do I architect this generative AI workload to meet all of my business requirements, my business SLAs? Um, if resilience is a concern, so uh, how do I make sure it's highly available? How do I have disaster recovery in place? How do I identify the potential threats that I could open this application up to? Um, governance and compliance was another important factor that he brought up. I think those, that's very critical when it comes to security. Um, and it also is very critical based on the industry that you're, uh, that you're based out of. So if you're in a specific industry like healthcare or financial domains, uh, you know, sometimes there are policies and sometimes there are compliance certifications that you have to adhere to and there are certain policies that you have to follow. For example, you are not allowed to use PHI, PII, or any kind of proprietary data for any of these applications. So you can't use them in your generative AI workloads. Uh, sometimes there are data sovereignty mandates that you need to meet. Sometimes there are data residency constraints. For example, if your application is in EU, you know, there are GDPR requirements that you have to meet. So you have to make sure that you understand what compliance policies you have to meet. Uh, there are most of the customers in EU, they have to report their ESG criteria to the government, which is the environmental, social, and governance criteria. It's mandatory for them to rep uh, report that to the government. So 
it, you have to also make sure that you're collecting that data too for the reporting. So you're collecting the carbon footprint of these generative AI workloads, which could be tremendous because like I said, they are heavy computing workloads. So governance and compliance would be another key factor to keep it in your, keep in your mind at all times. Um, I, and he also mentioned data privacy and just the controls aspect. So I would say that anytime you're using any kind of generative AI technology, like any, any other technology, read the service level agreements, read the TNCs, hide all of the terms and conditions that you should be reading, make sure you go through all of that. For example, in Amazon Bedrock, which is our uh, foundational model provider managed service, we have many foundational model providers and they all have different models and they all have different terms and conditions. So if you're using an image model, make sure you read the TNCs for that model. If you're using an LLM, read the TNCs for that LLM. And if your organization requires certain uh, contractual agreements in place that are not in the licensing terms, you can also work with the vendor to come up with some uh, custom EULAs, like custom end-user license agreements can also be designed and generated. So I would say that those would also fall uh, very actively under the security domains here. Thanks. So once from the scoping metrics assessment, once I do the assessment that, okay, this is the scope I pick, and then I pick a workload, then I look into, okay, for this workload, what is that, you know, is what are my business requirement from a resilience or risk management point of view? Then getting into data, okay, how my data governance and compliance are, are required for this one, you know, this for the, does, does it need a GDPR applied? You know, look for what is to be applied, right? And then get into what, what legalities has to be attained before I go out and implement and then make it public to be useful, right? Uh, that's a very interesting one. So uh, that's one path, right? You know, if uh, my organization, if we, uh, any organization chooses to build their own model now, okay, what are the responsible practices they have to uh, take into consideration? Yeah, that's a loaded question, by the way. Uh, so responsible AI, uh, it has so many different dimensions, but I'll touch upon a few of them. So I'm sure a lot of you, all of you actually, I think pretty much all of you would be using some sort of a language. You played around with the GPTs or the llamas of the world or the clods of the world. So I'm sure you're like experimenting with these models already, but, and you're also aware that these models have the, they have a very strong tendency to hallucinate. So the first thing that you need to remember is veracity and hallucinations that, you know, um, these models, these large language models have a tendency to produce output that it that is apparently factual information, but it is verifiably false. So you need to have some sort of a human in the loop or downstream system which is verifying the output that has been generated. Second thing I would mention is toxicity. Um, you know, in traditional machine learning models, it could produce an output. It will produce a classification output or a regression output. You may not like the output, but you're not going to say, oh, this output is offensive. That's not what's going to happen. But in case of large language models, because it's so open-ended, they have the capability to produce free-form text, it's possible that the output might be toxic or offensive in nature. So there needs to be guardrails that you place in, in your generative AI workload development, which are handling toxicity as well, which, are handle, which, are, which is making sure that the output that is generated is not offensive to any kind of demographic group, any kind of racial group. Uh, so that's also very important. Data privacy, of course, we talked about plenty that, uh, you know, data privacy concerns have started leaking into the intellectual property concerns at this point. Um, I don't know if you've played around with image models, but if you ask, if I ask an image model right now, Tell, you know, generate an image for a field of flowers and make sure that it is in the style of Van Gogh or a Picasso, and it generates that image, that can be, again, it's a legal problem. It could be stylistic appropriation. Back when Picasso was painting these, he did not know that we we're gonna be using this data in language, in image models down the line, and you know, we'll take away from their skill set. So stylistic appropriation is also a very important and a very concerning le legal thing that has come up lately. Um, and from a large language model perspective, I think I can give an example. So if I were to talk about a consumer lending application, 
Um, it's supposed to tell you whether this new loan application is going to be repaid or defaulted. Um, you know, how would you define fairness in this situation? Maybe you define fairness by saying that it has equal false rejection rates for all demographic groups, all racial groups. But when you extend this to Gen AI, let's, um, it gets very tricky. Uh, let's say I'm asking a language model to complete a sentence, and the sentence is, Dr. Hansen uh, read the chart and fill in the blank. So that's what the model has to now fill. But you know, if you go to older language models, you'll notice that older language models used to invariably produce male pronouns. So it would have said Dr. Hansen studied the chart and then he ordered the tests. But this is not appropriate now. This would not be considered equity. This would not be considered security, safety, fairness, anything. Because what it should be doing is it should be having an equal probability of male, pro female, as, and perhaps even other pronouns at this point. So the way you define fairness has become less of a technical, I would say more of a definitional problem at this point. So we have to think about all of these when we are designing our own models. And it's not an easy problem to solve. So. I, I'm with you on that. It's definitely not an easy problem. Uh, yes, uh, having mechanisms in place definitely help you, and having uh, evolving mechanisms in place would always help you, help to add uh, the upcoming areas where it has to be addressed. You know, fairness is one good area. Uh, equality uh, and it has to be customized. It doesn't have to be one for all. Uh, of course, we are out of that stage, but at the same time, it has to be more customized to the areas where we are applying that, okay? And uh, what I hear uh, from you both is from an architectural standpoint, you know, one area here is an architecture for security, and the other area is about responsibility, you know, having a responsibility in place for that, right? So if uh, in that, if we look at how AWS is solving that, you know, in the both areas, how would you say that? Uh, Part, you want to take that first? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of ways uh, that AWS is tackling, uh, trying to tackle this problem, right? Uh, so the first one is um, we mentioned about Amazon Bedrock service. So uh, Amazon, um, you know, being the first cloud provider started in early uh, 2000s. Um, what we usually call internally is, is security is job zero at AWS. So everything, every product that we start with, we first start with a security in mind. Um, Amazon Bedrock uh, is also following the same principles. Uh, so think of it this way. Whatever uh, you know, uh, managed serverless service that you are using, for an example, uh, Lambda, which is a compute service, or RDS, relation database service, uh, Amazon Bedrock is also following the same standard. It provides third-party model, but those third-party model is actually being hosted inside AWS and managed by AWS. So it's not about data is going to third party. Third party doesn't even know how many times model has been called or what is being called by a customer. It is all AWS, so there is a big security layer for that, where the first concern that I mentioned about the data leaks and, and other things, those data is not going to the third party. So that's a big differential factor. Um, on top of it, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, as Isha mentioned, that there will be toxicity or, or some output could be um, offensive. What AWS does is uh, there is a, one more feature of Amazon Bedrock is uh, Amazon Bedrock guardrails. What it does is it adds the security layer on top of this Amazon Bedrock uh, service where any output coming out of the model, uh, it checks that if there is a PII inside that uh, output, it can redact that PII. If there is a, um, a specific word that you define or, or offensive language, it can stop the output or it can uh, you know, uh, redact some of the responses. Uh, so this way, adding a more and more security layer and features so that not necessarily you want to use it, but whenever you feel like you want to use it, you can enable those features. So uh, AWS is trying to add more and more security layers on top of how this model works. Um, other than uh, just a bedrock services, is a security scope matrix that I talked about, uh, that is one way that we are trying to see how um, using generative AI combining to the enterprise existing security discipline that uh, a customer can do. But there is also a well-architected pillar. Um, you guys might uh, know that um, 
AWS comes up with a well-architected pillar for everything you do in your cloud, whether uh, all different uh, disciplines. And we have a security pillar specifically for well-architected, uh, as part of well-architected pillar, where all the focus will be on security. We do have some lenses. So we have a machine learning lens for well-architected pillar, which defines how machine learning um, workload can be deployed um, with the best practices on AWS. Um, I would highly recommend to also look at that. That will help you to define the pipeline, how it works in the machine learning focused workload compared to the normal workload. That will help you to understand and set some of the uh, processes accordingly. And uh, lastly, I would like to touch upon two points. One is uh, the, you know, the hallucination uh, which I talked about. So uh, there are different practices. Um, you guys might heard uh, RAG, retrieval augmented generation, uh, so that any output will use certain data from your organization, and it will reduce the hallucination because the output should be from the document that you provide and nothing using from outside. So there are different uh, architectural patterns that you can use. And AWS is also coming up with a lot of solutions. A uh, lot of solutions are available in GitHub or available from uh, AWS, where it will be easy for you to try out these uh, workloads or try out uh, experiment uh, on this. And those are actually scalable to move into production as well. So uh, I think uh, uh, alongside with it, you can also reach out to the account team that uh, your organization is working with. Uh, and they should be able to help you in terms of how you can deploy Gen AI workload securely in your environment and, and scale it to production. Thanks, Parth. I know security and then the machine learning, I think these two areas we are focusing today as well is going through that every quarter or if possible every half year, once in a half year, I think that's one of the good practice so that you evaluate your workload or your application, whether it is attaining to the norms and practices or the standards which are required. You know, that really helps you a lot. So uh, you want to share your thoughts, Aisha? How would you see those? What's your understanding? Yeah, um, I think uh, Parth covered almost a lot of it, but uh, I'll just sort of double click on it. For any kind of workload, for a generative AI workload, just like any other workload that you deploy on AWS, make sure that you know, you're know you following the security practices that are already well established. You know, Network isolation, you're using a VPC, you're making sure data is encrypted in REST and in transit, you have your encryption keys, uh, you have cloud trail logs to see who is accessing what part of the service. So observability, monitoring, so you keep continue to do all of that that you've been doing, but um, I, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you have also heard that security is a shared responsibility. This is something that we say very often, which means that we do our bit in providing you the infrastructure and the service and making sure that we have done that in a secure manner. But on top of that, you also have to make sure that you are uh, you've put in the right security policies in place. If you need encryption, you've enabled encryption. So that's on you. Uh, but some of our managed services, for example, Amazon Recognition, if you've not heard of the service, it's a top level AI service. Uh, um, it's for computer vision, image recognition, facial recognition service. Even for recognition, we use a very diverse set of annotators to label the data. So uh, we make sure that the annotators are coming from different diverse uh, ethnic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, different demographic groups, different genders. Uh, we also make sure that we are uh, continuously testing for robustness. So when we are testing out facial recognition, we change you know, attributes, hair length, eye shapes, and we, make, we check the model against the outputs that is generating constantly. Um, even after the model goes to production, even after the service has gone GA and we, are, we have customers using that service, there's still continuously feedback that we are gathering for that service. Either that's coming directly from our customers, directly from the field, or it's coming via focus groups that we hold. So um, we make sure that there's no model drift and it's still relevant in today's age and time. And if it needs any data augmentation, if it needs model retraining, then we have to do that for our services. Um, I would say if any of you are interested in understanding what 
kind of responsible AI design practices we followed or what kind of, uh, you know, how we dealt with fairness, transparency, governance, and everything that we've been talking about. Uh, we have this new feature, or not a feature, but we have this new source of truth. Uh, it's called AI service cards. So you can go and get an AI, you can actually go and get a service card for any of our, any of our AI services. So if you want to get a service card for text tract, you can actually go get that. It's publicly available. It will tell you what responsible AI practices we followed for Textract. It will tell you every, uh, all of the design choices that we've made for that particular service as well. This is good. So, so there, if you adopt a mechanism where you assess, identify, and adopt you know, as we move forward, and you can always learn the standards which uh, you know, organizations like AWS are using that, that would be very helpful for any organizations who want to embark on this journey, right? Oh, that's good. So at AWS as well, you know, AWS has been partnering with the different institutions and organizations to keep up the standards, adopt new standards always. Like, you know, a few of them are Global Partnership on AI, Responsible AI Institute, uh, and uh, National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee as well to adopt best practices today. Yeah, that is definitely good. And to, to conclude, right, how should organizations should foster uh, you know, a culture of irresponsibly AI and have a development on an ethical AI practice like AWS? Uh, so I think um, uh, I, I would say definitely go uh, the, the things that we talked about, like scoping metrics, well-architected pillar, uh, you know, definitely start from there. Uh, it's an evolving uh, process, so you need to make sure that it, which applies. Um, I would also recommend to uh, utilize the feature from models. So for an example, uh, if you can ask model like think step by step, it will explain that how it arrives to a situation, a certain, certain answers. Uh, not in detail, but at least you will get some idea or, or use a scratch pad of, of kind of functionality. Um, log all those uh, input, output, responses, uh, and identify that what your organization is asking to the LLM, what is the answer that they are getting, and whether the answer is as being changed over time or not. Uh, so you need to, uh, you know, uh, figure it out that how it is being used uh, and uh, how it is being consumed uh, and how it is being changed. So eventually you can identify that, you know, uh, over the period of time, how you can expand it, whether you need to fine tune or whether you need to uh, self train. So all those things will be helpful to start with. Uh, and the last thing I would say that um, uh, you need to train the users, not only the development or, or your uh, you know, team, but also the end user, because this is a new calculator, right? Uh, you need to explain them that what they can get out of this particular system, uh, how it works, so they understand that don't just take it for granted, like whatever response is coming out, just, just use it. Uh, they need to understand how to maximize the use of this LLM. It, it, it's a great tool if you are using it smartly. So uh, <clears throat> definitely I would double down on training for the end user as well. Thanks, Bob. Isha, please. Um, I think I would also second the training point here. So definitely, I think, um, include training as a part of your organizational system. Like if you have an ethics or a responsible AI training for your developers, for your machine learning engineers, for the data scientists, any, everybody who's involved with the development of this workload. Um, if uh, they are aware of, you know, the potential algorithmic biases, if they can understand the impact assessment of a toxicity, of fairness, of transparency, of governance, I think those are important things that they should be trained on. So I would definitely second that point. Um, and I think I'll, I'll keep it short. I just want to say that don't make responsible AI an afterthought. It shouldn't be a peripheral thought anymore. I think it should be something that you, like I said, get it, like if it's, in, if it's something that you're thinking through at the very inception of a project and you're incorporating it along the entire life cycle, that's going to yield the best results, I think. And from a security perspective, I think overall you're going to be in a, your, your posture is going to be stronger if it's, if it's done earlier rather than later. Definitely, it's not a one-time training to be done. It, it's an, again, that's also an evolving space. So uh, thank you very much, Isha, and part on that. With that, I will conclude today. You know, looking at the time, I have definitely have a few more questions. But looking at the time, I should, I should say I could conclude today. And uh, 
you know, with that, consider a few things. You know, there is one concept which I've heard, uh, which I've heard and I listened to as well is red teams. You know, I think that started in Twitter, I guess. But that's the area where it's a combination of two different areas of expertise. One is security, the other one is people from the AIML field as well. So it's a combination of their, it's a, every, probably most of the organizations are adopting that. So it's, it's good to have, you know, if there is any mechanisms in your organization as well, it's good to, you know, have that, probably publish that somewhere so the others could also adopt that. Uh, with that, uh, I, you know, that's all I have to share today. Uh, if anyone has any anecdote to share, I would love to hear that. If not, yeah, I can conclude this one. Thank you very much, Isha and Parth. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great weekend, guys. <laughs>